Good morning, everybody. This is Andrew Plato, President and CEO of Anishian Enterprise Security, and this is Get Ready for PCI 3L, Anishian's webinar this morning on the new PCI standard. I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I think this is going to be a lively and interesting conversation for those of you who are uh, who are already dealing with PCI or are looking to have to deal with it next year. So let me take just a moment and introduce myself. Uh, I think a lot of you know who I am, but uh, for those of you who don't, I am the president and the CEO of Anishian. Uh, we're an 18-year-old information security consultancy. Um, been in the business a long time. I've done a lot of different things. Um, I've done a lot of different security projects. Uh, a lot of people know me for uh, a couple of different things. Number one, I was very integral in helping to design and, and deploy one of the first inline IPS products. Uh, but the thing that I always like to tell, remind people of is, is that... Um, Back in 1995, when I was a tech writer, I actually discovered SQL injection while I was working on a site at Microsoft. I didn't know it was called SQL injection, and I, I, I didn't write about it probably as much as I should have, but it was, uh, it was an interesting discovery, and it's what fueled my interest in information security. Let me take just a second and tell you about Anisha, and I think a lot of you know who we are, and you kind of know our story. Um, but if you don't know our story, um, we are Anishian Enterprise Security. We're an information security consultancy. At Anishian, we believe that information security can make the world a better place. Uh, we believe that security is a necessity for innovation and growth. If you want to build a successful business or a successful organization of any kind, you need security. If you look back in history, uh, growth, innovation, civilization depends on security in order for th good things to happen. We also believe that security, when done practically and pragmatically, um, can be an empowering force for organizations. Um, and we believe that good security, that practical, pragmatic approach, comes from rational, scientific methods of analysis. These are the things that define us at Anishian, and they define the services and the solutions that we offer. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about PCI 3.0, of course. Uh, let me give you real just short what my intent with today's presentation. Uh, first, I want to review some of the significant changes to the PCI DSS. Um, and then once we kind of get through all those, I've got a, a strategy, a task list, as it would be, for how you're going to get ready for 3.0. So whether you're currently compliant and, and need to worry about dealing with the changes to 3.0 or whether you're not compliant and looking at potentially becoming compliant, this task list should be applicable. So here's a quick outline. I'm going to talk about some general themes and deadlines up front. Um, then we'll go through the changes. I've kind of summarized them into categories rather than just you know line iteming each new requirement. Uh, we've got our strategy for compliance, and then at the very end, of course, we'll be taking questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, there's a question feature uh, on the GoToWebinar here. Uh, please use that. You can also use the chat feature if you want to chat to me, um, and then I will, uh, I will uh, reiterate the question to the audience, and uh, we can go from there. Okay? All right. So let's talk about the general themes for the PCI 3.0 number of sort of big topics that that govern what what's in the new standard um, when we look through it and read through it the, the the standards council has really they've tried to go after a couple of sort of big issues so one of the first things they did is they integrated the guidance so the, the, the you know in the past the 2o standard the guidance documentation was always separate from the standard so You'd have to have the standard document, and then you'd have the guidance. They've integrated that directly into the standard. So the new format, the new layout is you have the requirement text, you have some description, and then you actually have guidance on a, on a third column off to the side. Um, that's helpful. It, it puts everything kind of in one place. It makes it a little easier to interpret and understand the intent of the standard. Um, there's a real strong uh, movement toward getting third-party providers compliant. You're going to hear this talked about a lot in this presentation. So there's, a, there's really almost an all-out assault on getting third parties kind of into the uh, ecosystem of PCI. 
bunch of new requirements regarding point of sale devices. The standard, uh, the standards council uh, is looking to kind of go after skimmers and 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 other people who can manipulate those those uh, uh, point of sale type terminals. Uh, there's a couple of new requirements regarding that. Uh, the penetration testing requirements uh, get some real serious teeth, and you're gonna you're gonna get a whole slide to keep dedicated to the new penetration testing requirements, which I have to admit. We're at Anisha and we're kind of giddy about those changes, and you'll see why. Um, but one of the big concepts that the new standard tries to promote is this idea of driving security and particularly compliance as a business as usual process. And they they define a number of key sort of practices that they are that the council wants people that, that wants compliant entities to start following, which is this idea of monitoring their controls con continuously, not, you know, not going out and buying and implementing a bunch of controls and then just ignoring them, um, addressing failures quickly, having practices and methodologies and, and, and procedures that can identify and analyze and address failures or breakdowns or breaches quickly, not have these breaches go on for months and, and months with nobody noticing them. Um, there's a big section in the change document about change and how how organizations need to address every, any any significant change to their organization. They need to address what is the impact of their PCI scope, and this includes not only just infrastructure and application type changes, but also organizational changes, uh, like you're buying a new company or you're dissolving an, a, a a part of your business, or maybe you're moving around who's responsible for what. They want to encourage companies when they do these things to think about what the impact to their PCI scope is. Um, and I think the motivation here is that a lot of breaches, a lot of security problems come from changes to the organization that were either not planned or uh, nobody kind of thought through what the impact of those changes would be. Um, periodic reviews of controls, meaning they want to encourage organizations to go around and conduct somewhat routine audits and assessments of their controls, um, and reviewing that hardware and software remain supported. This is a particularly relevant uh, recommendation, considering that Windows XP goes out of support next year, and there's still plenty of organizations out there that are using Windows XP. What this whole concept is about, this business as usual sort of guidance that the council is giving, it's all about stopping checkbox compliance. The, the council, and I can tell you a lot of us QSAs, we're really kind of sick and tired of the checkbox mentality uh, that's out there. And unfortunately, there's a lot of assessors who really kind of embody that checkbox mentality of, of PCI compliance. So the new the new rules are all about that, and really what it comes down to when we here at Anishian look at these changes, um, one thing sort of jumped out at me, which was if you're currently following the 2.0 standard um, and you're being very honest about the intent, meaning you're, you're you're really following kind of the letter of the of the law in PCI right now, then quite frankly the changes you're going to see in 3.0 are going to be very minor. Uh, it's going to be little tweaks here and there. You're going to have to add a little bit. I, I, you're frankly not going to experience a lot of changes. But if you're cutting corners, if you're practicing this kind of checkbox compliance, then those organizations are really going to struggle because a lot of these changes are all about cutting off avenues of cutting corners. Um, and so. I think there is going to be some companies that are going to struggle with these changes, but not, but not all. Um, if you're a service provider, particularly something like a cloud hosting provider or a call center, um, you need to be really serious about PCI now. Um, the new standard has some extremely clear guidance towards service providers. And quite frankly, and, I'll, and I've got a whole slide about this, if you're a service provider and you're providing services to like merchants or, or, or assessed entities, then if you're not PCI compliant, you absolutely either need to become PCI compliant or you need to basically stop providing services to PCI compliant companies because 
the new 3.0 standard is, is really going to cut off um, uh, service providers who are no who are no longer compliant. Like I said, 3.0 is taking a big swing at checkbox compliance and the assessors who enable that process. Okay, so what are the deadlines? Um, there's this lots of good news here. So the 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 3.0 uh, the 3.0 document is already out. It was published back in, in early November. So you can go to the Standards Council website and download it right now today. Uh, and I'd encourage all of you, you know, after this seminar, get online and go download it. Um, it becomes effective, meaning you can actually start complying against it uh, in January, so about three weeks from now. Um, the the 2.0 version does not become formally retired until the end of 2014, meaning you can continue to comply with the 2.0 standard all the way through 2014. Um, you do not need to comply with 3.0. Uh, you don't need to comply with the new 3.0 requirements until June of June 30th, 2015. So you've got a good year and a half um, to to. to to implement the new 3.0 standards. And you'll notice if you download the new document, uh, the new 3.0 standard, you'll see that a, that a lot of the new requirements, they have this language in there that says, up until June 30th, 2015, these new requirements are considered a best practice. And, and it's just that. They, you're not required to comply with those uh, in 2014. However, realistically, uh, as a QSA, I would tell you, um, you should plan for 2014 to be your year to to convert to 3.0. Again, particularly if you're already doing a good job with 2.0. There's really not going to be that big of a, of a difference. Okay, so what are the big changes that we're dealing with here? Um, some of these are some of these are interesting, and some of them are, are are kind of not very interesting. Let's start with with what we see as a pretty big one. Um, Segmentation in PCI 3.0 gets, gets quite a bit tougher. Uh, the language of what is in scope has gotten significantly clarified. And, and specifically, I put a quote up here, any component or device located within or connected to the CDE. Um, for a long time, segmentation was, there was a little bit of fuzziness around it. If you put stuff outside of the CDE, there's some QSAs who would allow you to leave those items out of scope. Um, that just isn't going to fly anymore. Basically, anything that connects into or out of the CDE is now in scope. And, and CDE is cardholder data environment. For, for, uh, um, so that's going to potentially bring a lot of systems that organizations currently do not believe are in scope, in scope. So things like Active Directory servers, antivirus update servers, patch management servers, anything that is connecting into the CDE is now in scope for compliance, period. Um, and, and if there's any kind of connect, connectivity. Um, another change is that all of the PCI controls now apply to everything in scope, not just the CDE. So again, this was another kind of fuzzy area whereby things that were outside of the CDE, you could, you know, kind of not have some of the controls there. You could, uh, you know, some QSAs would say, well, you don't really need, you know, like file integrity monitoring or you don't need log management on the non-CDE items. Not true anymore. Uh, the new standard all in-scope items, whether they're in the CDE or outside of the CDE, that they now, all the rules apply to them. Um, and that has the potential to be a pretty significant change. Now again, if you've been following kind of the letter of the law in 2.0, that really shouldn't hurt you very much, um, particularly if you're an Anishian customer, because this is how we've kind of always interpreted the standard, and if you really parse the language of the 2.0 standard, this is pretty much what it says. But there are QSAs who have allowed non-CDE items to remain out of scope, and, and that's going to go away. Um, one of the key pieces of language that they've put into the standard is this idea of out-of-scope components must not be able to compromise in-scope components if they get uh, hacked. So that's kind of the, 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 the litmus test that we're going to take on out-of-scope components is if it gets hacked, could it potentially compromise 
the or, or the the CDE or or you know payment card systems. So something like an Active Directory server is an example. I mean, obviously, if that got hacked or compromised, and you're providing authentication capabilities into the CDE, that is something that could def definitively uh, um, cause trouble for the CDE system. So that would definitely be in scope. Um, and that and that that language is directly in the 3.0 standard now. Um, one other change, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in another slide coming up, um, is that uh, penetration testing now must validate segmentation efforts. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's some other great stuff coming on pen testing, so I'm going to I'm going to leave a little bit of suspense on that one. Um, but that is another big change, that a pen test must not just pen test, it's got to actually validate the, your segmentation efforts. So, Okay, let's move on to the next big one, third parties. Third party providers are going to get a lot more scrutiny. There's a lot of interesting changes here, but I want to start with one that I see, at least we see at Anishian, as a real potential game changer particularly for smaller e-commerce providers. It's this idea of the iframe redirect. So for those of you that aren't familiar, let me explain this. So a lot of smaller e-commerce, actually a lot of big e-commerce providers, do what's called an iframe redirect on their website. So when you go to check out, you know, you buy all your, your goods and you, you put them into a shopping cart. When you go to actually pay for, for the item, a little iframe within the web page pops up and that iframe contains the code and the link from the outsourced payment provider. And that iframe is actually all uh, coming from the third party website, the, the other, you know, the, the whoever is doing the payment processing. For a long time, and I will admit even us at Anishian were, were on, the, on this uh, boat as well, if you had an iframe redirect on your website to your payment provider, your website was not in scope for compliance because the actual code was coming from another site, from your, from your payment processor. Okay, that's not going to fly anymore. Uh, the new standard makes it really clear that anything is, that it, you can't do that anymore. You can't be out of scope. You have to, you have to do a hard redirect to the payment processor, meaning your site needs to actually completely redirect to their site. Um, and everything on the page needs to load from them. It can't, nothing can load from you. There's a reason behind this, and it has a lot to do with like cross-site scripting and a lot of these client-side web application attacks. The challenge with these iframe things is that you can have malware on the frame web page that actually can then get inside that iframe. That's actually relatively easy to do. Um, and so the, the challenge is, is that you'll have e-commerce sites with relatively undefended websites um, that are getting hacked and then the iframe that is redirecting for the payment, um, the malware or whatever is actually reading the content out of that and, and harvesting um, uh, payment cards. So this, th this is a pretty big change. Um, it's kind of buried within the language, um, and it's, it's going to potentially cause a lot of issues for these small, smaller uh, e-com providers. So if you're an e-com provider and you're using an iframe redirect, you better make a plan to get rid of that iframe redirect, because um, otherwise your web server is now in scope for compliance. Um, the other big change, um, is there's a, there's a lot of changes around third parties and their ability to impact merchant compliance. Um, what it really comes down to is if you're a third party and you have, you have some impact on an assessed entity's uh, compliance, then you have to be compliant. Uh, there, there's really no, there's no wiggle room in that anymore. And they've specifically enshrined that with, with a, a new requirement, 12.9, that has two pieces to it. Number one, service providers must document exactly what aspects of PCI they cover for their clients. That's kind of part number one. And part number two is that that, that has to be in a written agreement. Um, and they need to attest that they will maintain PCI compliance over those areas uh, that they are responsible for. Now this is, this is big. This is a big deal um, because 
this this addresses what we call the overlapping rock problem, which rock is report on compliance. So it's particularly relevant to things like cloud hosting providers. So we have customers and we've dealt with companies that have this sort of, well, if I put my website in like Amazon, which is a, a, a compliant hosting provider, you know, my site is compliant, right? No, it doesn't work that way. The, the challenge with places like Amazon or Azure or, or other service providers is that their compliance only covers a handful of PCI requirements. So their ROC, their report on compliance, maybe covers 10 requirements. Well, the other 200 requirements still apply to the merchant. And there's this misnomer amongst a lot of uh, merchants that if they just put it in a compliant hosting center, you know, bada bing, they're, they're compliant. And that's just not true. So what 12.9 is doing is saying places like Amazon, which actually Amazon already does this, um, places like Amazon or other service providers, they need to specifically state these are the requirements that we cover for you. You know, we cover 1.1 and 1.3 and 2.4, whatever. And they have to outline that, it has to be documented, and it has to be in a written agreement. Now, I can tell you right now, a lot of service providers that I know don't do that. Um, so they've got to very, very specifically define that and get it into their contracts. Um, the other change that is relevant, and this is more relevant for like managed security or managed IT shops, is uh, service providers with remote access to customer premises. Notice that that's emphasized. There's good reason for that. Must have a unique logon for each customer. So what that means is that if you have an outsourced IT provider, they must have a completely unique uh, logon for, for accessing your environment. Now, what's interesting about this is that the, the language is customer premises, not CDE. Well, customer premises is a much bigger word than CDE, which means they don't even need to necessarily have access to the CDE. They have to have a unique logon if they have any access to anything inside your organization. Now, presumably that's going to apply to organizations that have the ability to impact payment card data. So if you have vendors who don't touch or don't have access to payment card data, then they shouldn't be an issue. But if you have like a managed IT provider, this, this potentially could impact them. They cannot have a common logon for every customer that they have. And I can tell you, we're, having worked with a lot of managed IT providers, they almost all have the same password logon. So, um, I see there's a couple of good questions, and I will uh, I'll I'll wrap back on those and start answering them when we get to the end. So, okay, so web application improvements, um, some interesting changes regarding web applications. Um, two new requirements, and these are really just expansions of existing requirements. So, uh, six five uh, was always the requirement that had to deal with web application vulnerabilities, uh, cross site scripting, and that kind of stuff. Um, they've added two new components to that. The first one is kind of interesting, um, that organizations, and this is only if you develop a web application that handles payment card data, um, web, uh, if, if uh, you must document how you handle PAN and SAD, which stands for primary account number and sensitive authentication data, you've got to document how that's handled in memory to minimize exposure. Now, all things being equal, that's that frankly development teams should be doing that anyways but this is this is kind of an unusual new requirement in that if you're because a lot of these web applications you know they take in these payment cards they put it into memory they you know they they submit it for authentication or you know whatever and then they write some, some something in the database and then presumably it's purged out of the memory well Development teams now need to document that. They need to explain how the PAN is put into memory, how it is killed out of memory. You know, when sensitive authentication data is retrieved, where does it go? How is it written? How is it dealt with in memory? Um, all the, again, that isn't a huge new sort of uh, requirement, but it is going to it is going to hit development teams. It's going to require them to kind of step back through their web apps and really explain how. Uh, how their web apps are handling this data. And particularly what it comes down to is, is minimizing exposure. 
Um, what they're really kind of trying to go after are these apps that put stuff in memory and then leave it there um, and don't kill it out of memory for hours, months, or days. Um, and that just sits in memory, and a lot of new malware has the ability to kind of go through and scrape that data out of the memory. Um, there's another new requirement, 6510. Uh, which is a new requirement for authentication and session management. This is just an addition to the other web application vulnerabilities. Uh, again, all best practices that, frankly, organizations should already be doing. Uh, flagging session tokens, no session IDs and URLs, and using timeouts on web applications. Um, again, if you're getting a web application test performed on an annual basis, Pretty much any decent web app test is already going to have identified this is an issue, and you already should have fixed this um, because it's a pretty common vulnerability. The, the standard is now just enshrining that as something that you, uh, you, you need to address. Um, there's a very interesting odd change in 6.6. So 6.6 is a somewhat contentious requirement. Um, it got a big change in the 2.0 standard. So 6.6 is the requirement that, requ that, that requires you to do a web application penetration test and fix whatever the problems are. Or if you can't fix all the problems, then implement and deploy a web application firewall. Um, and you kind of had a choice. You could do either or, which at Anishian we always tended to recommend that it's kind of good to do both. If you're going to have a web application firewall, you still really should test your, your app. Um, and if you don't have one, then you definitely, you have to test your app. But what's interesting is, is that the, the council is actually backing off on the requirement of the WAF. You now can have your web application firewall in monitor-only mode and be compliant. Um, that, uh, that, that doesn't sit well with, with me, personally. I wasn't particularly fond of this change. Uh, I think if you're going to invest money in a WAF, um, you should put it into blocking mode. Uh, otherwise, why the heck are you buying it? Um, you know, why invest in big, expensive technology if it's not going to actually do what it's supposed to do, which is protect your environment? Um, but you know, a lot of big organizations, you know, there's this fear of, you know, oh, if we put it into blocking, it might, you know, melt down the core of the planet or something, you know, equally uh, apocalyptic. Um, so I think this is a, you know, this is a um, uh, sort of a uh, um, you know, the, the council's somewhat giving in <laughs> to the whiners on this one. Uh, I can't say we're exactly thrilled about it, though. Okay, uh, so let's move along here. Skimming prevention. Uh, new requirement, 9.9, must implement practices to prevent tampering with payment terminals, uh, which means all those, um, all those uh, little scanner terminal thingies that you see, that's, there's a technical term, thingies, um, that you see uh, need to be uh, much better protected moving forward. Uh, so you need to maintain a list of all the devices, an inventory uh, of all the devices. Uh, there needs to be a periodic inspection of those devices to ensure they're operating correctly. And you need to provide training for personnel to identify tampering or suspicious behavior. Now, on the surface, this, this new requirement is kind of like, yeah, OK, whatever, that seems, yeah, that seems reasonable. Um, and, and for most organizations, it probably won't annoy them or bother them at all. But if you're a if you're a large distributed retail organization like a uh, like a store or a uh, you know a gas station or a convenience store, you number one you could potentially have thousands of these devices. You think about it: if you've got a thousand stores and every store has got a few of these, I mean you could have three thousand, four thousand of these devices. That's a pretty big inventory. And having to go and periodically inspect those, I mean, that's basically a full-time job for somebody. The bigger one that I think is going to be more difficult is this training for personnel. Um, frankly, I'm not aware of any training to identify tampering of, uh, of, of, of like pin pads and stuff. I'm sure it exists, but this isn't exactly something that's real common right now. So meeting this requirement is going to be kind of tricky for retail companies. For the training requirement, I think what we're looking for here, at least what, what we at Anishian would recommend, is some sort of communication to all staff um, to identify common like skimmers or, or, or behaviors and something akin to like a newsletter or a document, something that they have to sign off on and review. You know, here's how to identify uh, skimmers or, or people who are tampering with these devices. Um, 
how that's going to get integrated into the whole HR process and how you're going to go through all that, that's going to take some figuring out to do. And I have to say that's, that one's causing a little bit of head scratching even amongst us. Um, so this one, if you're not a retail, if you don't have a lot of these pin pads, this one really doesn't affect you at all. If you do, this one could be a potential big issue. So you'll want to get your hands around it uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, now we get to pen testing. I've been waiting for this slide because this one, uh, this one makes, it makes me, and I think it makes a lot of us at Anishi, and there were big smiles when we saw this one uh, because in my opinion, this, is, this has been one of the bigger loopholes in the PCI standard for a long time. Okay, so what are we talking about here? There's a new requirement, 11.3. Um, it states that you must implement a methodology for penetration testing. What that means is, is that it, it must be, you must describe exactly how you're going to conduct uh, penetration testing. Or the vendor that you use needs to uh, have a, a methodology. And that methodology needs to be based on an industry standard. It cannot be some crazy thing that some, you know, uh, you know, psychotic lunatic thought up at 3 in the morning, although that might be very interesting. Um, it needs to be based on something like the NIST pen test standards, which I should note, the Nishian standard uh, methodology is. Um, it must cover the entire CDE. No more of this, you can just test here and there. No more of this, just test one IP address. The pen test must pen test the entire CDE. It must test inside and outside the CDE, which means everything that's in scope, including all of those out of scope, you know, all those devices that are not inside the CDE but are technically in scope. It must also validate segmentation. If you're using you know, firewalls or VLANs or whatever, the penetration test must specifically address that the segmentation efforts have been done correctly and are, and are proper. Um, it must cover application layer vulnerabilities as well as network layer ones. And you must retain your test results and document your remediation efforts. Okay, what is all this about? Well, why are they doing this? Penetration in PCI has been, for a long time, the, the big loophole. Um, and there is a whole industry of cut-rate pen testers who have built, frankly, large empires on conducting these utterly worthless and utterly ridiculous, you know, pen tests. Um, the council is basically saying, that's over. You're not doing that anymore. One of the most common complaints we hear amongst other QSAs is that the pen test they get is just an utter joke. It's a, it's a port scan from Nessus. Uh, it's just a vulnerability scan. There's no, there's no actual testing going on here. There's no person conducting any kind of analysis. It's just, it's a joke. And the problem is, is that penetration testing is so vital to making your security and these compliance regulations actually work because the whole point of a penetration test is to validate that the, that the, that the controls you've implemented are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so if you're, if you're kind of cheating on the pen test, then essentially you, you could also be cheating on all of the controls that you're implementing because the pen test doesn't validate that the controls do what they say they're supposed to do. Um, I can tell you right now that if you're an Anishian customer, you're fine because we actually practice real penetration testing. You're not going to have a problem with your pen test. 11.3 is really not going to affect you. If you're not a, if you're using a cut rate El Cheapo, you know Joe's Scan Shack, uh, or some kid you found on Craigslist to conduct this pen test, you're going to have a real problem with 11.3 uh, because these cut rate places are simply not going to be able to cut it. Uh, their their simple scans are not going to be compliant, um, and so what's going to happen is the whole pen test sort of community is going to go through a pretty significant change here this next year to respond to this particular issue. Uh, one thing I can say is probably almost a certainty is penetration testing is going to go up in price. Not a Denetian because we already do legitimate penetration testing. Um, but those cut rate places are going to either go out of business or they're going to have to, they're going to, have to start doing things right. Um, again, you probably are sensing sort of our delight at this because it, it really, it's just, it's trying to get PCI to really kind of and get people to play by the rules um, and to conduct these tests fairly and honestly. Um, bad penetration tests are not just 
a waste of money, which they are, they're, they're, they're deceptive because they can, they can convince you that you're more or less secure than you really are. And if you're not conducting them fairly, um, it's really kind of misleading. And, and I'm probably going off on this topic way more than I should. Um, so uh, this is a pretty big change. There's a couple of other sort of uh, smaller changes. Um, two that I'd say make us QSAs somewhat happy. Um, is that scope of compliance is now definitively the responsibility of the assessed entity. This is a challenge we've had as QSAs throughout our, our years. That we, you know, we go out to a client site and they're like, okay, tell me what my scope is. And it's like, it's not our job to tell you. You have to tell us what your scope is. Uh, we're here to validate that. Um, so uh, scope of compliance is now the responsibility of the, of the assessed entity to define. And the two new requirements, or two changes to requirements, that now enshrine that is that the, the assessed entity must maintain an accurate network diagram that shows cardholder data flows. Now again, 2.0 required that too. Now they're making it very clear that the assessed entity needs to, needs to produce that, and the QSA needs to merely validate that. Um, they also need to maintain a complete inventory of all system components that are in scope for compliance. That means every server, application, uh, anything that's in scope for compliance, the, the assessed entity, the merchant, the service provider, whomever, needs to maintain that inventory, not the QSA. Uh, again, that's another one we've gone into places and they're like, okay, well, yeah, I produce an inventory of all my gear. And it's like, no, we're, you know, we're, <laughs> that is what we do. It's your job. Um, so the, 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 the new 3.0 standard is simply just enshrining these things. Again, you're already following this in 2.0. This one won't be a big deal for you. A couple of other little somewhat minor changes. Uh, antivirus requirements got a little more specific. Um, you have to prevent AV tampering now, um, which, again, almost all AV products already have that. Um, if you have systems that are not running, antivirus like mainframes, you're required to keep track of threats to those systems. Uh, basically you need to know if there's vulnerabilities to those systems and have some kind of strategy to deal with those uh, patches or updates or other controls. Um, not a lot of clarity about what, a, what keeping track of threats means. Um, I think it could be as simple as again just knowing what threats are out there and understanding whether you're vulnerable to them or not. Uh, clarified the intent of what log review is and relaxed review of non-critical logs. So now it's much more specific what you have to review on a daily basis. That's uh, like security event logs and, and, and real specific things inside the CD. You don't have to review everything uh, on a daily basis. Um, clarification, the default passwords must be changed for both users and application and service accounts. That seems like a bit of a duh sort of change to me, but um, it's just a clarification that You've got to change them for both. Um, and they kind of clarified the password rules and reorganized them. Uh, the complexity requirements and the timeouts and all that didn't change very much. But they kind of reorganized how they fit into the standard now um, without any real significant changes to them. Okay. So those are the big changes that have occurred. Let's talk about how you're going to be compliant. And I see we've got, uh, we've got quite a few questions, so I want to start getting to those as soon as possible. So what is the strategy for, for meeting this new 3.0 standard? Well, first off, you're going to go download the DSS 3.0 today. Uh, as soon as you get done with this, with this uh, presentation, I, I expect the, the Standards Council website to get hit by all of you. Uh, go download the standard and start reviewing it. There's a good change document out there that is okay. It's not great. It's a little bit of salesy kind of pitch from the Standards Council, but it, it does the trick. Um, once you've got that, I think the first thing you should really do is get and revisit your CDE segmentation. Um, you, you've got to know your, exactly how you're segmenting your systems and exactly where data flows. Now, again, it, most of you are probably already doing this. Uh, I think you need to validate that and get a good, clear inventory of everything that is in scope. And you've got to particularly evaluate those things that have connections into or out of the CDE but as of right now, you don't consider them in scope. Those are probably now in scope, and so your next audit, you're going to have to bring them into, into your assessment. 
you need to conduct a real tough review of your service providers. Um, and you, you first off, you've got to require them to specifically define the requirements in PCI that they cover. Um, you need to know exactly how you're using an outsourced payment provider. If you're doing that iframe thing, you better have a plan to get rid of that next year and move to either just a hard redirect to their website or some other kind of component. Um, you know, I, I put here, don't just assume that you can outsource compliance. That's a, that's a real big mistake that a lot of companies make. And, you know, I, I like to tell to our, I like to say to our customers all the time, you can outsource a task, you cannot outsource a responsibility. Well, PCI is kind of the same way. You can outsource certain requirements of your PCI compliance, but you cannot outsource the full responsibility. The full responsibility is yours as a merchant, if you're a merchant. You are responsible for your compliance. Now, the fact that you use an outsourced you know, cloud provider or something like that, they may be, be, be able to cover a lot of your compliance requirements, but they may not be able to cover them all. In fact, very few can. I don't think any can, actually. Which means compliance is still ultimately your responsibility. And so you've got to know where their rock and your rock what covers what? And that's why you need them to document those requirements that they cover. If you have a non-compliant provider, you're going to have to get tough with them and you're going to have to just lay on the line with them and say, look, you're either going to get compliant this year or you're going to move. I know of a lot of smaller kind of cloud hosting providers that have been skipping along not being PCI compliant for years. Boy, I can think of a few of them off the top of my head. Um, and this is the end of the road. They're going to either going to have to bite the bullet and become compliant, or you got to move out. You're going to have to fire them and move to a compliance uh, data center. Um, that's just a reality. This is just the way the business is going right now. Um, so you should take a hard look at those third parties you use and say to them, "Look, you got to be compliant. Here's my deadline. And if you can't, then we're going to have to move to a new vendor." Um, you need to prepare to expand your penetration testing efforts. Um, if your penetration testing report is, an, is a printout from Nessus or Nexpos, that isn't a real test. Um, you need to get a real test. Now, those of you who have an Anetian penetration test know you get a report, which has got analysis in it, and risk assessments done. That's a real pen test. Um, it's got a person conducting an analysis of that data, analyzing it, and determining what is a real threat to your business. That's a pen test. Uh, you need that vendor to be able to provide you with documented methodology. Um, and you need to ensure that the penetration test is going to evaluate segmentation. What it comes down to is, is that you need a new, if, if you've got one of these kind of cut rate vendors, you need a new vendor and you need them now. Um, but be prepared. The prices of penetration testing are probably going to be driven up because of this change. If you have point of sale systems, you should start inventorying them right now. Go out and find where all of them are, uh, get a good inventory of them, and you're going to have to start thinking about how you're going to train people on that tampering. Um, I will suspect that there will be material cropping up throughout the year to help on this. Um, I would look to find some way to communicate with your employees uh, some sort of document that can demonstrate some, some key sort of tampering things that happen. Uh, and the last thing I would say is, you know, you need to schedule a 2.0 to 3.0 gap assessment. Um, if you haven't had a gap assessment yet, uh, I'd get one on 3.0 versus 2.0. You might as well. There's no point in, uh, I mean, you might as well bite the bullet and go for 3.0 now. Uh, there's no time like the present. Um, if you are already compliant, then I would prepare for 2014 to conduct a 2.0 to 3.0 gap assessment and determine exactly the areas where you're going to need to, to, to make some changes. Again, you're an Anetian customer, I almost guarantee your changes are going to be pretty minor. Um, but if you're not, uh, or you're, you know, like I said, you're using some of these other sort of uninvolved, you know, assessors who you never see and you just dump data into some portal somewhere, um, yeah, that's, uh, you're going to have to really sort of think, through, think these things through. Okay, so I did see we had a number of great questions come up. Let me see if I can, oh, wow, there's a lot of them here. Okay, so um, okay, so I saw one question from a customer. I'll answer that directly to the customer. Are, machi are machines that establish a two-factor authenticated VPN client 
connected to the CDE for purposes of CDE configuration and administration in scope for PCI, specifically the physical security requirements? Good question. Um, the two-factor authentication bypass, as it would be, has always been a, a little bit of a gray area. Um, so w what I'm talking about here is, is that if you were doing remote administration into the CDE, you had to have two-factor authentication uh, to access that environment. Um, and then uh, the, the, the machine that actually accessed that system could generally be considered out of scope uh, for compliance. I think the new requirements are going to require all of us QSAs to really take a hard look at that. Um, I can't say definitively whether those machines will be out of scope or not. I think we're going to have to parse the language. I can tell you that my preference would be, and I, I, I believe from a technical perspective, that if you're doing remote administration into the environment and you have that two-factor authentication, um, you should be able to kick like workstations and that kind of stuff out of scope. Uh, because that seems kind of unnecessary, unnecessarily burdensome. Um, however, there's a couple of strategies to get around this, things like jump boxes. Uh, put a jump box, you connect to that, the jump box actually connects into the environment. Um, now you've, you know, you're, you, you've kind of separated yourself a little more from that. Um, I would say I would be prepared for the reality that anything, and I mean anything, that connects into the CDE is now going to jump into scope. Um, where I see that as potentially burdensome is places where you have like a lot of VDI clients uh, and they're accessing, uh, uh, they're accessing stuff inside the CDE. I'd say there's a good chance all those VDI clients are going are gonna to are gonna bounce into scope where they are not in scope now. Um, so I don't know if that's the best answer, but that's probably the best I can give right now. Um, let's see, what's our next question here? Uh, so set it and forget it WAFs make some web developers lazy. Um, I would think it would be better to monitor and consolidate the logs into something actionable. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the, the, I think the thing is is that and this, this gets to a sort of a bigger topic and I kind of alluded to it when I, uh, when I was talking about this is that I think it's kind of ridiculous for companies to spend a lot of money on security controls like intrusion prevention systems and you know, UTMs and next generation whatevers and web application firewalls only to, to spend ungodly told zillions of dollars to then drop them into their environment and then not actually have them protect anything. Um, that seems like buying locks for doors and then never actually locking the door. Um, why even have a lock at that point? You might as well just get rid of the lock and save your money. Um, so I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the council, though, remember, gets a lot of pressure from the big online retailers. Um, and, you know, think about it. If you're a gigantic online retailer, uh, you know, 10 minutes of downtime right now, for example, in December could be millions of dollars in lost income. And I get it. That's a big, serious threat. Um, it seems to me there's ways around that. Um, technically around that, uh, that your WAF doesn't have to be an issue. But, you know, let's face it, um, if 10 minutes can be $10 million, yeah, I can, uh, I can understand that. So, all right, so next one, does, how does uh, PCI 3.0 affect providers of security software? Should vendors expect merchants who deploy their solutions to be asking new and different questions uh, as a basis for doing uh, business, signed agreements? Um, Yes, but what it's really going to affect is when that software is something akin to like a cloud-based or whenever a vendor has the ability to kind of get into the environment and do something. So if you're a maker of software that's you know, just retail off the shelf and you deploy it and it's the vendor's problem, that's not going to be a problem. Where you're going to see an issue is more on these like cloud provider type things like uh, if you're providing like a cloud console for antivirus. I could see that as becoming a potential issue because those cloud consoles uh, could potentially be in scope for compliance for uh, for uh, uh, merchants, for companies that are using them. Uh, so it's it's a lot of these cloud services that we're all relying on now and are great have the potential to start coming into uh, coming in scope for companies. What that means is the questions are going to be: I need you to tell me exactly what 
elements of PCI you cover. And I have a feeling a lot of cloud providers are going to be like, well, we don't know what we cover. So you're going to have to determine what you cover. Um, and if you cover anything. And if you don't cover anything, you need to be able to say that. Keep in mind that has the potential to put uh, these kind of cloud providers at a, at a competitive disadvantage. Because if I'm cloud provider A and I say, hey, I'll cover you know, 25 of your PCI requirements. And cloud provider B says, I don't cover anything because I don't like that PCI thing. It's wrong. Well, cloud provider A now has a competitive advantage to cloud provider B. Um, particularly if cloud provider A can very clearly dis uh, delineate exactly what they cover because you have to do that now. So um, I think it, I don't think it's going to affect sort of the traditional software vendors, but it definitely has the potential to affect uh, cloud type providers. So, okay, uh, let's see, next one. Any updates on tokenization and defining what is in scope versus out of scope in regard to tokenized data? No change really in tokenization. If you tokenize your data, um, that data is not considered in scope for compliance. Uh, the only point that is considered uh, in scope would be where it is tokenized. So if you have a server and you hand your data to that, it tokenizes it and then, and then puts it into a database somewhere else, the database where it's put into isn't necessarily in scope. Um, but the tokenization server would be. Or if you're handing this off to a cloud provider and they're tokenizing it and handing it back, um, then that process of handing it to them and then handing it back is, is, is in scope. But anything else beyond that point is not. So tokenization is still a great strategy. Um, it's a great way to get a, a big chunk of your environment out of scope. Uh, you, anybody who is handling payment card data should very seriously consider tokenization. Um, and there's no significant changes in the standard uh, regarding that for this time around. Uh, what is the frequency and uh, and what is the frequency of the more intense penetra penetration test? No frequency changes. You need to simply have a completed one as part of your annual audit. So you don't need to do them more often. Um, if you want to, you're welcome to, um, but you don't have to. Uh, okay, next question is, uh, let's see. Okay, that's not really a question. <laughs> um, okay, so we are a service provider for handles transactions on behalf of clients. We have VPN tunnels to clients where we post payment transaction ID, not cardholder data, to their web services from our CDE. Based on what I've heard, this would pull our customer systems in scope. If so, then I'm assuming a redesign would pull uh, would be to put the system that gives them this data as in scope. Uh, outside of the CD on our side, of the, okay, that's a complex question. Um, first off, your your customer systems can it, it's hard to justify a a customer systems as in scope for compliance for you. Um, th that's kind of like one of those well maybe's. Um, at some point, it becomes their responsibility. What you have to define as a service provider is what you're covering on behalf of that customer. And then once you hand it back to them, that kind of starts to become their problem. So the idea, I think, that we're talking about here is you need to create a line where this is what we cover and this is what you cover. And you need to be able to line item the, the aspects of PCI that you cover. If you're handling payment card on behalf of this client, or on behalf of your customers, then obviously the environment where you handle it needs to be compliant and you need to be able to state that. So you need to be able to say, you know, is when the data flows from here to here to here, it's in a compliant system. And then when we hand it off to you, we hand it off to you in a compliant manner. Once that data gets handed back to your, to your customer, well, that becomes their problem, frankly. Um, you don't have to make their systems become compliant. It's kind of more the other way around. Your customer needs you to have their compliance depends on your compliance, not the reverse, okay? Uh, as a service provider, your compliance doesn't depend per se on your customer's compliance. Your customer's compliance depends on you. Does that make sense? I feel like I kind of flip-flopped back and forth on that a couple of times. So I wouldn't, what I'm basically saying is I wouldn't worry about your customer systems. What's more important is to worry about your systems, keeping the data compliant when it's in your environment, and then when you hand the data off to your customer, making sure you're handing it off in a, in a secure and, and compliant manner. 
Okay, uh, next question. What role or what are your thoughts regarding ADC application delivery controllers with respect to PCI? For example, WAF built into a separate like Imperva. 11.3 pen tests and network pen tests, best practices and thoughts. Okay, I, you know, whole WAF application delivery controllers, first off, I'd see those two technologies as extremely similar. Um, I, they, they obviously do slightly different things, and I know the technologies are not totally uh, the same, but um, they're really just providing application delivery and then the ability to kind of control that and, and do special sort of controls around how that application works. Um, the thing is, is that your penetration testing that needs to be performed is kind of, it's, it's your penetration testing the environment as it is in place. And the whole point of a pen test is that we want to validate that if you have things like a web application firewall um, or you have things like intrusion prevention systems, that a lot of our attacks, our attempts to, 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 to uh, uh, execute an attack should be blocked. So, for example, if we conduct a, a scan of your environment and we detect that there's a, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a vulnerability in some web component, right, um, and we see that the vulnerability is there, if you have an intrusion prevention system or a WAF that's protected, is properly protecting that environment, when we go to actually attempt to exploit that vulnerability, we should get shot down. Which then, in our report, we should say, "Well, we detected this, you know, vulnerability, but we weren't able to exploit it, so yeah, this doesn't seem like a problem." Um, and that's the whole point of getting a real pen test: is that it isn't just, "Oh, here's a bunch of vulnerabilities; do something about them." Um, because you may have protections in place, which is the whole point of buying a WAF or an application delivery controller, um, that actually prevent those uh, prevent those weaknesses from being exploited, um, and that's what your pen test really needs to bear out. Um, so the long and short of it is is that um, you know you need to get pen tests. Your pen test should be pen testing with your security controls in place. Uh, and validating whether they're actually protecting the environment or not. And again, if you had an Anetian pen test, you'll know you've been through this. You've probably seen our report where we said things like, well, we saw this vulnerability, but we couldn't exploit it. And nine times out of ten, that was because there was something else preventing us from doing that. Okay, uh, I hope I answered that question. Let's see. L uh, last question here. Uh, scoping of PCs that provide payment to third-party SSL website on behalf of customers. Um, so apparently there's a travel agent. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, you, you, are, you have a, a, a workstations that you're taking in payment cards and sending them out um, to, um, sending them out through SSL to a payment provider's website. So um, on behalf of your customers. Uh, well, you'd sound like you're a merchant. Um, you mentioned you're a travel agent, so you're a merchant. Um, and those workstations would be in scope for compliance. Uh, you would need to uh, protect them uh, ideally, and this is what we typically recommend, is if you're a small shop, maybe have a single workstation that does the payment card transactions. Um, you could do something like uh, accessing a, a virtual client uh, to help kind of get it out of scope. Otherwise, you're just going to have to consider those uh, workstations in scope, which means uh, they're going to need some log review, they're going to need antivirus, they're going to need file integrity monitoring, they're going to need the full set of controls around them. Um, there's a couple of ways to kind of mitigate that, um, but uh, yeah, as long as that system is taking in a card and transmitting it somewhere, then then it's 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 the transmission, you know, it's a, a transmit store or process payment cards brings it into scope. And again, let me just reemphasize a point that I know you've, we've all probably heard a thousand times, but encrypting payment card data does not take it out of scope. Uh, that is a common, common, common misnomer, that if you encrypt it, it's suddenly out of scope. There is only one instance where encrypted, in, uh, encrypted payment card data is out of scope, and that is if you're using something akin to a point-to-point -point encrypting device. So. Uh, in this case of the travel agent, what I would recommend you do if you want to hold your costs down is get one of those point-to-point uh, -point encrypted uh, terminals and do your swipe cards through that. And don't use your PCs. Um, those little terminals, you know, Verifone or you know, there's a bunch of them. You can get them from Costco if you're a small shop. Um, use those and use them on a phone line. Uh, 
If you really want to keep yourself out of scope, put them on a telephone, an analog telephone line. At that point, um, nothing in your environment would be in scope, as long as you're not doing any payment card data on your actual uh, PCs. Okay, so we're getting right to the end of our time here. Uh, that is the end of the questions I've had. Um, so I want to thank first everybody for coming today. I hope this has been informative. Uh, I hope you've all gleaned some good information from this. Uh, I have the slides available on SlideShare shortly. Um, I'm recording this, so uh, we'll have a recording of this put up on YouTube hopefully fairly soon. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, I hope uh, if there's any other questions or comments that you have on this, please feel free to email info at anishian.com, and we will be uh, happy to uh, try and respond to your question in a timely manner. Otherwise, thanks again, and have a happy holidays, all.